So good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, depending on where in the world you join us from today. And welcome to this webinar, organized by the BMJ in partnership with the Asian Development Bank and UNICEF. My name is Dr. Ashley McKim. I'm Director of Partnership Development at BMJ, and it's a great pleasure to be your moderator for today's session. The topic for this webinar is preparing the front line for the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, learning from the past. And we're delighted to be joined by an international panel of speakers from the Philippines, Indonesia, and Fiji, who will share their experiences and views on the topic. We'll finish the session with a panel discussion where you can submit your questions for the speakers to answer. Just a reminder, this session will be recorded. Your microphone and videos will have been disabled, but please make sure to add your questions to the Q&A box and any general comments to the chat box. We're gonna kick off with a quick, quick, quick poll to hear some of your thoughts on this topic. Um, so you should see in the screen, just in a moment, a quick poll that will come up. Um, we've got three questions for you today. Um, first question is, would you take a COVID-19 vaccine? Second question is, what do you think is the biggest challenge for vaccine delivery in your country? And if you scroll down, you'll see a third question, which is, if you're a healthcare worker, do you have support and training to deliver COVID-19 vaccine? So take a moment, please go through those and answer those questions. Um, We'll show the results in a second, but we'll probably be just discussing those later as we go through today's webinar. So please take a moment, uh, go through, choose your answers to those three questions. And in just a moment, we'll show those on the screen to, to get things started. Great to see so many answers. We'll just give you another couple of seconds. So if you haven't submitted your answers yet, please do so. And then we'll show those on the screen. So I think, Kyle, if, if you want to, if you want to put this up on the screen, we can see those answers. Um, so I think, you know, great to see as we, we expected that most people would take the vaccine. Um, I think as we go through today, you'll hear a lot of the challenges that you've, you've, you've picked up, that trust in vaccines, misinformation, the logistical requirements around things like cold storage. And also, um, I, I think that, you know, this is a new, I think, a global challenge for all of us. Um, and I think it's good to see that some people feel they've got the support, but we realize that a lot of people do feel they need more training and education as well. So we'll, we'll come on and talk about those later on as we go through today's session. So I, I think we'll, we'll start with our, our first speaker, and it's on my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Patrick Ostewe, who is Chief of the Health Sector Group at the Asian Development Bank. He provides leadership in policy, technical and operational matters, and leads the application of evidence-based and innovative approaches to address priority and emerging health issues in Asia and the Pacific. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> let me share my screen. Uh, once again, thank you so much. I would like to thank uh, UNICEF and uh, BMJ uh, for the great partnership that we have uh, to address one of the biggest challenges that uh, has ever faced uh, mankind, to try and immunize uh, more than 4 billion people in a period of uh, between 12 to 24 months is, is, is really, really a big challenge. And to do that, to give jobs to people requires human resources. And currently we have major challenges with human resources to be able uh, to do that. So I just wanted to share some thoughts. Um, uh, so the Asian Development Bank is the largest development bank in Asia and uh, the second largest in the world. Uh, we, we work across all sectors. We provide support across all sectors. And in the health sector, particularly in COVID, uh, we invested $20 billion uh, starting from April to support all our developing member countries to prepare and build the infrastructure uh, to address COVID. And in December, uh, December 11th, uh, we approved $9 billion uh, to support countries uh, to, uh, to obtain and deliver vaccines. So this is a big challenge uh, that uh, most countries and most organizations and most people are going to face. Uh, so I just want to say that there are, there are, three, that there are about uh, six critical things to think about as we, as we move towards uh, ensuring that uh, uh, we deliver and deploy vaccines. First is the issue of prioritizing, prioritizing the population. Which population are you going to, uh, countries have to reflect on who is going to get the vaccine first? 
uh, many countries and uh, the global guidance is to start uh, uh, with health workers and then uh, with uh, vulnerable population and then uh, the other frontline uh, workers. Now, many countries uh, are, are defining um, uh, frontline workers differently. Some of the countries are defining, uh, for example, the police or uh, the uh, people working at the borders as uh, frontline health workers. So this, uh, this is a big issue for many countries to ensure that there's equity and that you prioritize the right people. Uh, some countries as, uh, are also uh, focusing on the elderly because they are more vulnerable to the pandemic. Uh, others are also focusing on uh, uh, the, those who are economically viable to jumpstart the economy. So uh, they're focusing on those between the ages of 18 to 59, for example. <clears throat> The second and one of the biggest challenges also is that because of the shortage of vaccines, uh, most countries uh, will have uh, multiple vaccines at the same time. So the challenge is, and most vaccines are uh, two dose vaccines. So yeah, we might have a situation whereby you have two, three or four or five vaccines in a country. How do you allocate? Do you do that by province? Do that by district? And what happens if the first dose was one vaccine and then the second dose when someone comes a month later, uh, then the second dose is not available. Uh, what are some of the, what what are what are the principles that are used in such situations? So allocation of vaccines is going to be a big issue. Uh, the third one is uh, the distribution of vaccines. Um, some of our countries, for example, uh, we have a presentation from Indonesia. is a country of seventeen thousand islands. Uh, sometimes moving from one island to another island by plane is five hours. Uh, Philippines, another presentation from Philippines, a country of seven thousand islands. And so how do you distribute vaccine using cold chain and particularly for adults? Uh, we are very much used to vaccines for children, but this is the first time that we want to immunize billions of adults and so on. Completely new, we have to think outside the box. The fourth one is that of the vaccine, who's actually going to do this work? Uh, we know that in most of our developing member countries, we face uh, significant challenges with human resources. We just don't have enough health workers. Now, in this context, this is a, a, a vaccine that requires that to give a jab in somebody's arm. Uh, some element of medical training is required. So how, how, do, how do we go about, how do we go about this? Some countries are coming up with issues like invite, uh, engaging retired health workers, uh, retired nurses, retired doctors, uh, retired laboratory technologists. Other countries uh, are thinking about including medical students, uh, um, and and uh, nursing students will be part of the initiative. Uh, other countries are looking outside that and including, so for example, the military service. Uh, in the US, uh, where they have a challenge right now of trying to vaccinate about 1 million uh, people every day, uh, they're also mobilizing the National Guard to help uh, vaccinate people. And looking at how, what kind of infrastructure is required. This is just bigger than uh, just uh, the using primary healthcare facilities or hospitals uh, or other facilities. So looking at, in some countries are looking at using stadiums and using, uh, using all sorts of uh, uh, spaces that are available, schools to be able uh, to ensure that uh, they reach the critical masses. And then of course, uh, how, do you, how do you ensure that um, uh, the, the people who get the first dose get the second dose? Um, the, the kind of communication that is required and therefore there's no dropout. If you got the first dose, uh, you should get the, get the second dose. What kind of system is required to remind people and also to ensure that uh, uh, you track those who have taken the first dose, took the second dose. And then lastly, uh, these are new vaccines, uh, this potential opportunity for this potential for adverse uh, out, out, uh, events. And how do you monitor safety to ensure that if there's any problems reported quickly and then um, you rest, the country response or the, the, the technical team response. And also how do you deal with rumors and misinformation, significant misinformation is going to be there. So all these issues uh, requires a lot of training, uh, requires a lot of support from the health workforce, requires leadership from the health workforce, require policies in place and very significant coordination. And as ADB, we have significant resources uh, to support countries uh, to, because all these are preparatory activities even before the big resources are available to purchase vaccines. So we're here to work with you and to support the necessary, uh, the, 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 any, any, any skills that might be required uh, for health workers to, uh, to be able to uh, deliver on this big initiative. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Patrick. And um, it's really helpful to set the scene and it's great to see clearly the scale of the challenge that we face. Um, for audience, please post your questions in the Q&A box and we'll, we'll take these later uh, with Patrick. I'd now like to welcome our next speaker, Ms. Lulu Dewey, um, who's an epidemiologist at the Immunisation Subdirectorate at the Ministry of Health in Indonesia. Lulu's been with the Ministry of Health since 2009 and has been responsible for the polio eradication and measles rubella elimination programmes. Lulu will be sharing her experiences in vaccine monitoring from Indonesia. Lulu, over to you. Thank you, Ashley, for introducing me. Uh, good, if, uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. So I will share my screen. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Okay, let's start. Yes. Uh, I'm happy to speak at this web webinar, uh, especially to uh, share to you all about Indonesia's past experiences in conducting uh, missile rubella immunization campaign, especially on monitoring aspect. Uh, this is uh, just the background. Okay, we start with the background uh, of why we conducted uh, MR immunization campaign and how it was done. So this is the background. So at the 66th session of the WHO Regional Committee for Southeast Asia in 2013, so all the countries uh, have committed to reach uh, missiles elimination and rubella or congenital rubella syndrome, CRS control by 2020. Uh, so at that time, uh, the goal was to be reached by 2020. Uh, however, uh, the 72nd RC in 2019 revised the timeline. Uh, the goal to be achieved by 2023. Uh, uh, to achieve this target, uh, actually WHO suggested uh, the countries uh, to focus on ensuring two doses of MCV, at least 95% uh, coverage. Uh, in all districts uh, through a combination of routine services and periodic mass uh, campaigns. So Indonesia uh, committed to uh, implement all of these uh, strategies uh, and then we define our uh, national strategies. Uh, the first one is to conduct measles and rubella immunization mass campaign for children aged nine months to less than five, uh, 15 years. Okay, and the second strategy was to introduce uh, MR uh, vaccine into routine immunization, replacing the monovalent missiles vaccine, and then to improve the surveillance uh, performance. So we targeted uh, children uh, aged uh, nine months to less than 15 years, uh, who are the most vulnerable group. This age group actually contributed to about uh, 80 to 90 percent of measles and rubella cases in Indonesia. So they are the most vulnerable group. The number of targets uh, were almost uh, 67 million. This campaign actually was the biggest immunization campaign ever in Indonesia. Considering Indonesia is a large country, uh, the campaign was conducted in phase-based manner. In the phase one, uh, the campaign was implemented in uh, all six provinces in Java Island, the most populated island in Indonesia, in August uh, to September uh, 2017. And then the phase two covered the rest uh, provinces, 28 provinces uh, outside Java Island uh, in August to September 2018. Each of the phase were done in two months uh, with additional several days uh, for mop up activities. Yeah, uh, there were three important steps. Okay, the first one was uh, planning. During the step, uh, micro plannings were uh, developed. Each level, national, uh, province, district, until health center or healthcare facility uh, level, develop uh, micro plannings. And then advocacy and coordination to get uh, decision makers, stakeholders, and core sectors commitments and supports as well as uh, social mobilization activities uh, through some innovations to attract people's uh, attentions were also done. And then the second was uh, implementation. 
This step included ensuring quality uh, of services such as safe injection, effective vaccine management, safe waste management, and then uh, super intensive multi-sector approaches to overcome refusals as well as uh, risk communication. And then the next one was uh, monitoring. Uh, this step contained AEFI surveillance uh, at first even following immunization surveillance. Uh, Real-time monitoring using Rapid Pro. I will tell you later what is uh, Rapid Pro. With manual recording and reporting as backup, and post-campaign evaluation through uh, Rapid Convenience Assessment also use uh, Rapid Pro. So all of these uh, steps were aimed at uh, having quality services and reaching coverage at least uh, ninety-five percent. So this is the uh, overall coverage that. Uh, we achieve uh, both from the phase one and two achieve uh, 87 uh, percent after all the efforts done uh, the phase one was successfully implemented and reached the expected target we also with support from partners have conducted a coverage survey to verify the result of the phase one mr campaign the survey was done by a team from university of indonesia uh, the survey results show that three out of six provinces uh, reach the minimum the minimum of 95 percent coverage while the other three uh, had not reached the expected coverage target uh, the coverage uh, ranging from uh, 86 to uh, 92 percent so the phase two was not uh, as succeed as the uh, phase one we face people's refusals due to religious concerns halal haram issue uh, during the phase two implementation So these are uh, the challenges that uh, we face in the field. Uh, the first one is uh, refusals due to halal haram issue at the time. And then the spread of negative messages about AEFI. And then uh, many, many hoaxes about the vaccine and its content. And then also in some areas, uh, there was also uh, challenges on geographical barriers, uh, limited human resources and funding uh, in some areas. So these were the strengths, uh, strong commitment from the president, uh, Indonesia president, and other subnational government leaders. And then good cross-sectoral collaboration. We gain supports from other ministries uh, and bodies, as well as uh, religious and community leaders. And then uh, improve health promotion through innovation, such as local innovations to attract people's attention, community voices uh, to respond to vaccine hesitancy, and door-to-door -door advocacy. And then the last one is a real-time monitoring system uh, that really helped the health workers uh, taking immediate actions. Yeah, so uh, why do we need a, a real-time monitoring system in mass immunization campaign implementation? So monitoring during campaign can identify uh, progress towards targets. Uh, information directly uh, come from the health centers, from the field. And then real-time data will enable uh, immediate follow-up actions uh, to be taken. And then monitoring near the end of the campaign at the household level can provide a rapid assessment of the coverage. So we can uh, identify a proportion of target group who received the immunization through rapid convenience assessment uh, or RCA and identify uh, areas for mock-up uh, activities. So these are the reasons uh, based on our experiences uh, using the Rapid Pro for uh, real-time monitoring. So what is uh, Rapid Pro, by the way? So Rapid Pro is an SMS-based uh, application for real-time MR campaign coverage monitoring. Now it also can be WhatsApp-based. So uh, we also use uh, this application uh, during the IPV, uh, the injection uh, polio vaccine. Uh, in North Kalimantan province last year, we also use uh, Rapid Pro and it's uh, WhatsApp-based. So. Uh, the health workers uh, just send uh, through WhatsApp uh, their reports daily, daily reports. 
And then the, uh, this can rapidly identify problems to ensure timely program response. And then aggregate sub-district data, recorded, geocoded, and reported through SMS. Daily reports automatically generated for relevant uh, officials. So the phone number of these uh, officials should be registered first, and they got SMS uh, every day. Updates of uh, daily coverage. A dashboard is available to present a detailed report. So uh, beside the SMS that we got uh, every day, all officials uh, that are registered, uh, we can also see detailed report uh, through a dashboard. Yeah, this is just to uh, to show you how it, how it, how it works. Yes, and this is the uh, dashboard look like. How the dashboard look like? Yeah, you can see here. Uh, you can see maps, uh, and then uh, here you can also see uh, from this. MR coverage at national, not only at national, but uh, at sub-national levels, even until a health center or sub-district level. So you can see uh, the coverage until the field. Yeah, not only maps, uh, there are also graphs and tables uh, like this. We can utilize uh, the data for corrective actions if needed. Yeah. So in 2018, Gavi supported the MOH Indonesia and UNICEF to conduct evaluation study of the effectiveness of Rapid Pro during the Phase 2 MR immunization campaign. This study was carried out by Health Enabled and Reconstra. So this was a, a large-scale effectiveness evaluation. So the objective of the study was to measure the impact of the effective use of Rapid Pro and Rapid Pro data on the overall MR campaign phase two. So from this study, we got some findings. Uh, the first one is that during the first two months of the campaign, higher coverage was achieved by districts where uh, Puskesmas or health center had higher numbers of reporting this with more substantial effects in uh, sites that ever stopped uh, activities due to vaccine hesitancy. And then the second one, yeah, districts with higher average uh, health center reporting compliance were more likely to reach 100% uh, coverage. This situation happened in the region where the compliance of uh, health center report uh, more than 75%. Uh, these are testimonials uh, from the field. Yes, uh, like this, you, you all can see here uh, from Dr. Rahmi. Uh, she is uh, head of Cihampelas Health Center. So she said this daily coverage feedback is useful. Uh, when I see how we are progressing, I can see where there is a problem. I can ask why. I can trigger action to look into various uh, areas. That's what she said. And then the other one, uh, Miss Anu, uh, she is one of our immunization program coordinator in health center. She said it is easy to report. Uh, before, I had to remember and write it all down and come back to the health center office to report. It used to take four people to prepare the reporting. Now I can report the children I have immunized from anywhere and uh, anytime. So it's really uh, helpful uh, for the health workers and it's also uh, user friendly. So now we move to, we move to AEFI monitoring during MR campaign. So at that time, uh, AFR recording and reporting was still conducted manually using standard formats. Uh, we have uh, well-functional national and subnational or provincial AFI committee. All members are trained. AFI working group uh, or small team also available at the district level. AFI committee plays uh, also a vital role in risk communication as a resource person in media briefing, press conference, etc disseminating the result of causality assessment of certain AEFIs, which has become public concern, uh, also handling hoaxes about EFI. And now, uh, actually, we are switching into electronic AEFI uh, monitoring using vaccine safety website. So, so we have uh, developed this. Uh, and then for the COVID-19 vaccination that is ongoing now in Indonesia, we also try to optimize uh, the use of this website to uh, for recording and reporting the AFI. So 
what lessons uh, can be learned what can be applied uh, for COVID-19 vaccination and other mass immunization campaigns uh, learning from uh, MR campaign experiences so the first one is uh, that real-time recording and reporting system could generate real-time data this is important to enable immediate action plans help the health workers to send reports easily and improve uh, data accuracy and this is just uh, for your information uh, that now uh, the COVID-19 vaccination in Indonesia is now uh, using electronic and real-time based recording and reporting including for vaccination service recording and reporting as well as vaccine and logistic monitoring through an integrated system. Also uh, strengthen AEFI recording and reporting through vaccine safety website and then ensure high political commitment uh, so the president for uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccination, our president, governors, mayors, and other important persons at national and subnational level were vaccinated first to build public trust. So this is to, to really build the public trust, uh, uh, increase uh, public demand on COVID-19 vaccination. And then uh, to optimize uh, approach to cross-sectoral parties, uh, for example, army, police, other ministerial and bodies, health professional, organization, religious and community leaders or organizations, etc. These are important and should be uh, applied uh, for COVID-19 uh, vaccination and other mass immunization campaigns as well. And then the, the last one is uh, speed up the process of uh, halal fatwa from Indonesia Ulama Council for the COVID-19 vaccine. Learning from MR, it really, uh, it was really a problem for us. So uh, at this time for COVID-19, we speed up the process of uh, halal fatwa. Uh, just for your information that CoronaVac from Sinovac that uh, we are using now has already has a halal fatwa from uh, Indonesia Ulama Council MUI. Okay, that's all from me, Ashley. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lulu. And it's really helpful to have that retrospective and to look at the learning from, from past uh, management as well. So we'll come back to that later on. Um, great to see so much chat happen in the chat box. Just a reminder, if you're going to post a message that if you want to post it for everybody to see, please just use the blue button to select down for panelists and the audience as well. So we can all see that and also to post your Q&A in the Q&A box rather than the chat box. Um, so it's now my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is Miss Wendy Erasmus, who's UNICEF Specifics Chief of Child Survival and Development. Wendy is a specialist in mother and child health in developing context. Her career in international and emerging development work spans more than 25 years, four of which have been with UNICEF Pacific. She's worked in the East, Central and Horn of Africa and has experience in a broad range of sectors, including social protection, local government, education, urban and pastoral livelihoods and community development. Wendy will be sharing her experiences in vaccine logistics from the Pacific Islands. Wendy, over to you. Thank you, Ashley. Let me just share my slides here. Very good. Hello, everyone. I thought I would start my presentation by showing a picture of what it's like to manage vaccine logistics and delivery in the Pacific. So this photo is from the Marshall Islands where vaccines and supplies have just arrived by small boat. The UNICEF Pacific office covers 14 Pacific Island countries and territories with similar conditions as the Mar Marshall Islands. These countries cover 15% of the world's surface. Now to get a sense of how big that is, I have superimposed a map of Canada and the United States over a map of these 14 countries. Most of this area is water and only 0.04% of the world's population is living on more than 660 islands and atolls. Populations range from 1,300 in Tokelau to just under 1 million in Fiji. Transport and communication infrastructure is limited creating many hard to reach areas. Fiji is the central hub for the Pacific Vaccine Independence Initiative or VII, 
which was established in 1995 for the procurement and logistics of routine childhood vaccines and related supplies. It was created to help countries overcome very particular dynamics and challenges related to developmental, demographic, geographic, and global vaccine market realities. And it has three components to address these challenges, pooled procurement, bridge financing, and a regionally held buffer stock. Countries come together with relatively small volumes of vaccine orders and procure in a pooled manner. This increases their purchasing power and value for money within the vaccine market. The VII Capital Fund enables countries who are able to domestically finance their vaccines to pay for them within 90 days of invoice, and this helps them to overcome cash flow and regulatory constraints. Vaccines are shipped to the regional cold room in Fiji, after which they're repackaged and dispatched according to individual country orders. Efficiencies are gained in this way through economies of scale. As part of the regional hub, Fiji also houses the regional buffer stock, enabling rapid response to outbreaks, cold chain failures, or even poor planning. So the vast majority of childhood vaccines are ordered and shipped through this VII mechanism, but some vaccines do get chip, shipped directly to countries. So this slide is a schematic of the vaccine supply chain in the Pacific. It starts at the top left and is read clockwise. So using country data on stock levels and numbers of children vaccinated, UNICEF Pacific assists countries with annual forecasting and vaccine orders, and then consolidates these into one Pacific order. Orders are placed with UNICEF's supply division and suppliers ship the Pacific order to UNICEF's regional cold room in Fiji. It is here that UNICEF Pacific office repackages and dispatches to countries according to their specific order. Once vaccines arrive in country, ministries of health use their in-country dispatch system to get vaccines to subnational cold chains and health facilities where immunization takes place. Regular reporting takes us back to the beginning of the cycle. So this is the established system for routine childhood immunization in the Pacific. Now, before we move on to how we can use this as a foundation for introducing the COVID-19 vaccine, I think it's important to briefly explain the COVID-19 situation in the Pacific, because I think it's quite a unique one across the world. What this slide shows is that only six out of 14 countries have had any cases at all. And in all but one country, those cases have been border cases. As of yesterday, only two countries, Fiji and Micronesia, have active border cases. What this means is that for the majority of countries in the Pacific, we're not dealing with COVID-19, but rather we're dealing with the effects of COVID-19. And these effects have come about as a result of border closures and severely restricted international travel. Those countries who rely heavily on tourism are seeing a sharp decline in domestic revenue of up to 50% in, in a year. Pacific health ministries are small, and even though there are no cases, health staff have been heavily focused on keeping it that way. So what we're seeing is a reduction in the provision of essential health services, including routine immunization. COVID-19 vaccination, therefore, is an important tool and a priority for Pacific ministries of health to help these nations alleviate these effects. So going back to this schematic, at this point, I just wanna say that we really don't know how the vaccine logistics and, lo and delivery is gonna work for the COVID-19 vaccine. But nevertheless, we are building on and planning based on our existing vaccine logistics and delivery system. And for the rest of the presentation, I'll talk about how we are drawing upon these existing systems to prepare for the delivery of the COVID-19 vaccine. The first part of the supply chain is making sure that countries are ready to receive the vaccine. And I've circled that part of the chain and I'm calling it readiness. It is this readiness component that we've been working with countries to strengthen. To date, all 14 countries have established or adapted existing coordinating committees for the coordination of COVID-19 vaccine introduction. UNICEF and WHO have formed a technical team in each country to assist countries with the implementation of readiness tools and to help them develop national deployment and vaccination plans. In the past year, UNICEF doubled the capacity of its regional cold room in Fiji, 
and increased country level cold chain capacity. Now this is part of a 10 country initiative to introduce HPV, rotavirus and PCV vaccines. So when we conducted a rapid cold chain assessment as part of the COVID-19 vaccination readiness activities, what we saw was that this significant increase in cold chain capacity put the Pacific in advanced stage readiness for the introduction of COVID-19 vaccines with minimal additional investment needed for cold chain equipment. Now this is assuming that the vaccine can be stored between two and eight degrees. And lastly, UNICEF has been providing guidance to countries on forecasting and requesting COVID-19 vaccines. The next step of the vaccine supply chain for the Pacific depends on concerted international action, including UNICEF's supply division, vaccine manufacturers and suppliers, airlines and logistics leaders. It starts with the ordering that will take place at UNICEF's supply division, followed by the shipment from the supplier to the Pacific. And as we've seen, these may be pooled in one shipment to Fiji or may go direct to countries, depending on international capacity to find suitable vaccine shipping routes. In 2021, UNICEF Pacific plan, sorry, UNICEF plans to provide up to 2 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccine to 92 lower income countries. Now that's equivalent to 850 tons of supplies every month. More than 30 offers are under evaluation in response to a joint UNICEF PAHO vaccine tender. We've been stockpiling half a billion syringes, which is enough to wrap around the world one and a half times. And these are stored in our warehouse in Copenhagen, which is depicted in this video. Together with PAHO and the International Air Transport Association, UNICEF is leveraging its long-term collaboration with airlines and logistics providers to formalize and prioritize capacity, space, quality, and reasonable pricing for vaccine shipments. UNICEF has developed a COVID-19 market dashboard, giving a global picture of pipeline, manufacturing capacity, agreements, and pricing. And you can find this by searching UNICEF COVID-19 vaccine market dashboard. The next step in the chain is relevant for pooled shipments that come to Fiji. UNICEF Pacific is ready to receive the COVID-19 vaccine in its regional cold room, which is located near the Nandi International Airport. From there, we would repack it according to each country allocation and ship it to countries. Based on learning during previous emergencies and this past year, trying to get routine vaccines to countries, we've had to think beyond local commercial airlines. More specifically, we have collaborated with the New Zealand government to transport vaccines during the Pacific measles outbreak, as you can see from the photo on the top left. We've collaborated with PIHOA, the Pacific Island Health Officers Association, who has excellent connections with countries in the North Pacific to get supplies there. The Australian Development Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade arranged shipment of COVID test kits procured by UNICEF and the World Food Programme availed free of charge charter services to deliver routine vaccines to countries. Due to recent changes in air freight routings, vaccine shipments have had to go from Fiji to Pacific countries via New Zealand, where they face an extended stopover time. So we developed a collaboration with DSV freight forwarders to store vaccines in their bonded cooler in Auckland while awaiting connecting flights. So during these uncertain times, we're constantly exploring new avenues and collaborations to ensure secure routes for vaccines. The last step in the vaccine supply chain is in-country delivery. I think the best way to depict some of these challenges and solutions for last mile delivery of vaccines is through these photos. One of the challenges countries face is when local airlines offload vaccines in favor of other cargo or luggage. UNICEF has assisted ministries of health to develop MOUs with local airlines to prioritize vaccines and vaccination supplies. As you can imagine, boats are a necessity to get vaccines to hard to reach islands. In Tokelau, where there is no airstrip, vaccines face an extended sea journey from Samoa. To accommodate this, the ship has a cold chain to keep vaccines safe during the trip. UNICEF and the government of Vanuatu 
have been trialing the use of drones to deliver vaccines to small scattered communities, which are only reachable by foot or small local boats. Two phases of the trials have been completed and you can see in the photo on the bottom left, health workers unloading the vaccines from the just landed drone. Now, unfortunately, COVID-19 came before the drones could be fully integrated into the national supply chain system. So this final phase has been delayed. And so without the drone, last mile delivery will have to continue in the way that will be shown by the video in the next slide. Thank you, Wendy. And it's been really informative. I think that we've been reflecting in the BMJ on the huge advance we've made in things like vaccine development, which have given that paradigm shift of compressing 10 years of vaccine development into just one year. And I think the next big challenge is that logistic challenge, as you mentioned. So it'll be really interesting to see how we achieve that over the next year. So now I'm delighted to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Gideon Lasko. Gideon is a physician medical anthropologist and senior lecturer at the University of the Philippines Diliman and research fellow at the Tenio de Manila University's Department of Development Studies. Um, his researches include the politics of health, ethnomedicine and indigenous notions of health and illness. Gideon's going to be sharing his experiences in risk communication from the Philippines. Over to you Gideon. Thank you Ashley and thank you everyone for this opportunity to join you. I'm, I'm joining you from the Philippines, from Manila, and I would like to share with you some of our experiences over the past few years around vaccination. My colleagues, uh, Wendy and Lulu, spoke about the challenges of supply, and now I'm going to talk about some of the challenges we faced when the vaccine is there, but people don't want it. So let me share with you some lessons um, of course, like many countries today, vaccination is much publicized and highly politicized. So I'm going to flag these issues later. And in the Philippines in particular, complicating the challenge for COVID-19 is a milieu of long-standing low immunization rates. And then followed by recent controversies involving dengue vaccine, in which a report about greater risk of severe dengue led to mistrust and basically huge politicization across different domains in the country. Now, I will not adjudicate this controversy, but rather I would like to use this as a reflection point for communications lessons as we try to roll out COVID-19 vaccines. So, of course, vaccine safety communication has been long a concern across the globe and has been a growing number of works 
that reflect on on various issues and how they affect vaccination and communications experts have identified heuristics that people use in making sense of messages around the vaccines and all of these studies basically highlight the role of trust which in the survey that we did in this webinar we also saw people identifying mistrust as a big challenge the crucial role of healthcare providers from the doctors to the village health workers and to the value of personal locally contextualized messaging now for this presentation i will be organizing the lessons according to the guiding principles of the who vaccine safety communication namely trust credibility transparency empathy equity participation and feedback so look at this uh, demonstrate look at this trend showing how in the Philippines we've never really reached the targets of immunization it's been suboptimal and it's been exacerbated further by the dengue vaccine controversy there are many issues uh, I think Patrick showed earlier how and of course also Lulu showed up about how Indonesia is challenging in terms of islands and even the Pacific Islands as well the same goes with the Philippines there are supply chain issues and a weak primary healthcare system but what has been poorly explored is the local vaccine culture. What do people feel about vaccines? What are the long-standing ideas about vaccination, about needles and syringes that affect people's receptivity to vaccines? So just to go back very briefly around the dengue vaccine controversy, what happened was in response to dengue fever, which is a big public health concern in the country, Philippine public health authorities decided to approve a dengue vaccine in early 2016 amid questions about how soon we should do this, should we be the first country to do this. So there were some debate in the medical community. It was piloted in three regions covering 700,000 children and it was held at the height of the election season. So at the onset, there was this political component there. Now, one year later, Sanofi came up with this new uh, uh, paper showing that there's higher than expected severe risk of severe dengue among those vaccinated. And regardless of how you interpret this, it led to a, a, a big controversy in the Philippines. It gave rise to accusations of children dying because of the, vi of the vaccine itself, as well as lawsuits involving former and present public health officials. So it was very dramatic. One public attorney staged highly publicized autopsies of children claiming to find evidence that the vaccine caused their deaths. So, and I'm sure many, in many of your countries, you have some, some past experience also of a vaccine controversy that happened and how it affects today. So in the Philippines, it led to sharp drop in immunization rates, high levels of vaccine mistrust, health workers being ostracized, health workers being avoided by, by community members, and also demoralization on the part of the healthcare sector. However, and this is a bit encouraging for all of us, it shows that the rates of attitudes have already changed since that time. So we see increasing confidence in vaccines, suggesting that the public is actually fickle-minded when it comes to vaccines. They can be influenced by present information regardless of their previous previous ideas about vaccination. Even so, however, we see that for COVID-19, uh, surveys in the Philippines show that only 32% are willing to get vaccinated right now. So there's still a huge challenge, which goes back to the need for better communications. So what are the lessons that we've learned? First, of course, is trust. People keep talking about trust, but then some of the components that I will identify later also build on trust. So it's not just an abstract idea. There are some things that can be done to, to, to build trust. There was also a positive instance during the dengue controversy in which bringing in experts from a trusted institution on the Philippine General Hospital was decisive in winning over some of the people who are hesitant about vaccinations. Uh, for COVID-19, it's very important to let scientific institutions take the lead in communications. So we recognize the role of politicians in inspiring people to get vaccinated. I think Lulu highlighted that. But at the same time, politicians should avoid making specific knowledge claims. 
about vaccines that can be detrimental to the overall trust. And this is so important within the healthcare sector. So we've heard some of these concerns about vaccines raised not just by community members, but, but by healthcare workers themselves. So it's very important to build trust within the healthcare sector. The second component is credibility. So it's not just the institutions, but the individuals who are communicating should be caring. They have should show right expertise, honesty, and dedication. What happened in the dengue vaccine controversy was there were many different government actors speaking, sometimes speaking on top of each other. So it created a situation where all their credibilities were undermined. Independent medical doctors still emerge as the most credible source of information based on the experience of the Philippines. And I think that they should really be more uh, empowered to communicate. Uh, so in, in applying it for COVID-19, it's so important to avoid vaccine messianism, putting too much faith in vaccines, uh, overstating what vaccines can do for COVID-19 and for the, pan for, for the pandemic. Also avoiding using vaccines as populist tropes, using it to go after political and geopolitical opponents and many other ways to politicize it because they will erode the credibility of the whole vaccination effort. And in the long term, it's so important to mainstream communications and social science expertise in our health curricula. So medical schools seldom hear a comprehensive communications education. So it's very important to be for this to be part of curriculum of health, healthcare workers and health officials. Now, of course, Transparency is also so essential for these efforts. Uh, in, in the case of the dengue uh, controversy, people felt that there was no transparency at the onset, which led to mistrust. But at the same time, I would like to highlight what I saw in one city in Manila. The city health officer and his staff proactively reached out to the villages upon hearing of, of this new development of this higher risk of the vaccine. And they were the ones who relayed the information to the community and it preempted mistrust as compared to hearing those same messages from the media. So being proactive is one lesson in terms of transparency. And for COVID-19, it's very important for governments to communicate the rationale and the criteria, the reasoning behind the selection of particular vaccines while also being upfront with the risks and limitations of all of them. Now, so, so far, I've talked about things that are related to empirical items, uh, facts, factual information. But at the same time, empathy is also crucial when it comes to communications. The parents during this dengue controversy felt aggrieved. And one of the reasons why they kept feeling aggrieved is because they felt that they were not being listened to. So in the case of COVID-19, governments should show understanding the citizens about their concerns and not dismiss them outright. So statements like, you don't, you cannot choose the vaccines, just take it, just listen to us, are not helpful. We need to actively solicit feedback and address people's questions and concerns instead of just dismissing them or accusing them of politicization. Now, equity also figured as a principle that in the dengue vaccine, we saw the selection of regions as a, something that was flagged by politicians. Why are you choosing this region over the other? And of course, as we go to the COVID-19 vaccinations, there will be a question of who gets it first. And news of VIPs, politicians going ahead of the queue will undermine faith in the vaccination process. So it's very important to implement the vaccination programs in an equitable way in a, with very clear guidelines on who gets it first. While at the same time, looking at it in a broader equity framework, and seeing this as an opportunity to also improve the general immunization programs of systems. Because what's happening is that the overall public health system can be compromised in the name of responding to, to COVID-19. Participation is key. I think my, the other speakers highlighted that, including Lulu from Indonesia said that participation at all levels was crucial in improving the rollout of their vaccines. We saw that in the dengue vaccine controversy as well, when people felt that they were not included in the decision-making process and there was no enough buy-in as a result. So we should engage with communications experts, social scientists to understand the root causes of people's fears and mistrust, primary care workers, their inputs about the situations on the ground, 
and of course journalists as well and media outlets because they were they're the ones who will relay information and it can be sensationalized there has to be some engagement that's very much active between the health agencies and and the media and of course religious groups are also so important especially in in areas where they hold influence over the community and getting their support can also win over a lot of people and finally feedback uh, i already talked about transparency the need to show empathy and feedback and achieve many of these goals by showing people that the government is responding to them and not allowing the public to turn to other sources of information so they have to preempt these misinformation and disinformation both offline and online through vigorous feedback mechanisms and investing in social media and web platforms that will allow for this feedback to happen. And finally, accountability. It's not listed in the WHO guidelines, but I would like to highlight the role of accountability as well. So there are some useful resources that I put together in a Google Drive that you may want to screenshot the QR code here or, or get some pop. These are some resources that are readily available for this. But in conclusion, uh, the dengue vaccine controversy foreshadowed a lot of concerns that we see now in the Philippines. And I invite other countries also to revisit previous vaccination episodes for similar lessons because past can serve as prologue and we can learn from the lessons. Reassuringly, vaccine mistrust is not irreversible at all, but we need to earn trust and we can do this by partnerships, transparency, accountability, on top of long-term investment in building trust and capacity in healthcare systems. So thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to all the discussion. Wonderful, thank you Gideon. Really important topic and we've had lots of questions around vaccine trust and misinformation, which we'll come to in just a few minutes. And I'd like to invite all our speakers back on screen and we can open up for some discussion and questions from our audience. For our, for our speakers, please just raise your hand to the camera briefly if you want to comment on anything. Um, but perhaps I'll start with some reflections from Patrick, first of all. We've been hearing from our speakers about past successes uh, with vaccines in the Asia region. Coming to the present pandemic of COVID-19, I wonder if you can just reflect on how your hopes of vaccine rollout will, will happen over the next two years and what you think some of the biggest challenges are facing in the Asia region that we, we need to overcome. Patrick. Uh, thank you very much. This has been an excellent um, uh, presentation, uh, looking at the, uh, the, the lessons learned from previous vaccines, which, uh, which we've had many, many history uh, with. Uh, and the COVID vaccine are certainly new vaccines and, um, and with very limited history. So uh, I think that learning from the past is excellent uh, because uh, it can inform what are some of the challenges that we're going to face. And just to take the three uh, examples that have been given, uh, Indonesia, massive country, many islands, uh, how to distribute uh, vaccines, making sure that they reach at the right time, the right places in the right quantities, uh, and, uh, and that uh, the population is aware and they're available for that. Uh, the same applies to Indonesia, many islands and the Pacific, we saw the size uh, of, the, of the islands. And some of them are very small populations of less than 10,000 people. So I think that uh, in this regard, ensuring that um, uh, this is a collective effort that uh, will involve not just the health sector. I think for the first time, we've always talked about uh, working across sector, cross sector, but for vaccines, I think this is critical because uh, we will need all sectors to help. We will need the health sector to take the lead as a primary sector, but need, for example, uh, the military to supply the logistics that is required to be able to move these volumes of vaccines across the vast countries and the vast territories that uh, we've just talked about. The, there's no other entity in any country that's better than the military in terms of logistics and so and also the equipment that be able to move uh, to move uh, to move supplies. Uh, second, uh, we need the private sector. In some of our member countries, uh, the private sector play a very, plays a very significant role in terms of uh, service delivery uh, and uh, the, the, the collaboration between the private and the public sector, the non-state the non, uh, non -state sector like faith-based organizations uh, and other, other, other service delivery uh, entities is extremely important. So the leadership to be able to bring the various sectors together to try and solve this problem uh, is critical. The energy sector, uh, we saw the, uh, the video from UNICEF uh, the, if, if you want to maintain a cold chain in some of these areas, 
And we need to think outside the box and the type of uh, supplies of energy that be able to maintain the cold chain requirements, for, particularly for some of the vaccines that are very complex. So uh, working with the, with the energy sector. So for us as ADB, because we work across sector, we are talking to the transport sector to give us some ideas on what are the best ways to distribute vaccines across the countries very quickly. And uh, we are all talking to uh, the energy team to come up with models of uh, a, a portable energy that can be used to serve for cold chain. We are talking to uh, the social development teams to think about, to help us think through how do we reach vulnerable people to ensure that the poor are not left behind, particularly the elderly, for example. Uh, in, in adult, in the in childhood vaccine, most uh, children are taken to for hospitals. Uh, but uh, in this context, the elderly, for instance, some of them might have, might have other comorbidities like arthritis are not able to go to facilities. So we need to think through other means by which uh, uh, by, by, by which we, we, we reach those who are not able to go to health facilities and so on. So many challenges, we are providing significant resources. We are working with the best organizations out there. We're working WHO. We have mechanisms to transfer resources to WHO. Uh, we are working very closely with the UNICEF, uh, significant resources that are may, maybe uh, that are available to work uh, with UNICEF. We're working with BMJ to uh, with all your uh, networks across the world and bringing some of the leading experts to be able to see how we can engage with health workers. We're working with, with some of the top universities around the world. Uh, we are, for instance, just uh, in closing, uh, we are doing a hackathon uh, that, uh, that is ending at the end of the month uh, to look at, uh, at how do we um, uh, because, uh, how do we track and monitor these vaccines, particularly since the two dose vaccine. If the person gets the first dose, how do you remind them? How do you ensure that they come on time? Uh, and so on, and looking, and, and looking at best ways to do this with some of the leading technology uh, institutions uh, uh, the worldwide, looking at the issues around logistics. Uh, the logistics of this is gonna be challenge, a challenge because there'll be multiple vaccines uh, going to multiple provinces or multiple districts. How do you track vaccines across, across the, cha the, the value chain? And we're also working with their Facebook. We are engaging them to provide them with some questions to track some of the uh, some of the uh, Facebook collects uh, information uh, from 220 countries and territories every day. Uh, so we engaged with them and providing them with some questions that they can track every day around vaccine hesitancy and acceptance, so that that can inform. Uh, they can inform the, the work that we'll be doing with various partners and so on. So we look forward to collaborating with everyone. It's really exciting to see that with the lessons we can learn, but also aware that we have a big challenge going forward. Over to you. Thank you, Patrick. And, you know, I think you're completely right. And it's really important that, you know, the pandemic's been horrible. There's been a lot of death and devastation um, in, in people and, and economically as well. But alongside that, a lot of innovation as well. And I think, you know, during these tough times, we do see a lot of innovation. Things you've talked about around sort of digital health as well. It'll be interesting to see the longer term impact and how they can help with with future pandemics as well. And Lulu, you were talking about your experience previously. And I want to touch on a topic that's been sort of frequent throughout our conversation and our, our chat today, which is health misinformation and vaccine hesitancy. And I know Gideon, you touched on that in your presentation, but that's a challenge that I think many people um, from many countries today are, are sort of asking questions about is how do we how do we address that? And I want to turn to some of our panelists and sort of ask you, what do you think you need from those global bodies? So if you if you look at sort of the big international agencies, WHO, people like that as well, what can they do to better support you in your countries to address vaccine hesitancy and, and, and misinformation? Anybody want to take that first of all? Or maybe Gideon, do you want to reflect on some of your thoughts um, on that and how we can, as a global, uh, a global um, uh, society, um, help with with that issue? Yes, uh, WHO and other global bodies definitely play a big role because many cases in which there's disagreement among local actors, oftentimes people turn to global organizations like the WHO as an arbiter for information. So in the early phase of the pandemic, for example, people turn to WHO in terms of assessing the gravity of COVID-19. And they're, in a way, they're seen as above the political realm in, in, the, in the country. So they're seen as more, they can be seen as more credible. There are attempts to paint them as Western bodies. So there's attempts to delegitimize them as well. So they're not without any 
controversy or any question. However, they can definitely resolve issues at the national level that require a more nonpartisan voice. So being aware of that should mean that global organizations can be more proactive in, in really releasing information that will be useful for, for their local counterparts, that we, we can cite this information. Because, for example, now there's questions about vaccine safety and efficacy comparing different kinds of vaccines with each other. So only these global bodies can sometimes settle these issues within the countries. Thank you. Any, any of your pan panelists want to sort of make a comment, just please uh, raise your hand. Uh, Lulu. Yes, uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Gideon because uh, safety profile of the vaccine is something that uh, we always ask. Uh, even if we are um, like uh, having uh, seminars and workshops or training uh, to our health workers, they always ask about safety profile of the vaccines uh, like that. But uh, maybe uh, for WHO, maybe uh, especially WHO and other uh, global partners, maybe uh, please um, uh, open access uh, to us. Uh, please release all informations that uh, that, uh, are, that are needed for us, especially for the safety of the vaccines. Thank you. Yeah, and it's a challenge, you know, from BMJ's perspective, health misinformation is a huge challenge that we've, you know, trying to overcome as well. And one of the things we're trying to do is provide more evidence-based information for particularly clinicians out there as well. And I know, you know, Joanne and Patrick's comments around how companies are innovating, you know, Facebook, other companies are, are taking steps we've never taken before to try and reduce misinformation as well. So it's something that I think will evolve over the next year and hopefully leave a, a long-term lasting impact on how we roll out future vaccines in future as well. Um, Wendy, do you want to say anything? Sorry. Just to add that I think uh, a really strong country national surveillance system with a rapid response to AFIs, a rapid communication response to AFIs, I think will go a long way to building trust and, and helping to keep numbers vaccinated. Thank you. And Patrick, also feel free to turn your camera on as well if you want. Um, you're more than welcome to, to join us and have your camera on for this section. Um, I'm going to maybe, I think we'll probably come back to this because I know there's a couple of other questions, more specific questions around health information there as well. But I want to turn to, to Wendy, um, just to ask you a bit more details. We've, we've had a couple of questions around uh, vaccine rollout and particularly the, the points you mentioned around logistics and cold chain and, and storage of vaccines as well. What's your thoughts? We, you know, we're in this situation where you know we never thought we'd have you know one vaccine by this point. Never mind you know ten viable vaccines for many different vectors that need different requirements. What's your thoughts about how um, different countries with different capabilities should be procuring vaccine, and and you know what's UNICEF's response around the different vaccines? Are you looking at vaccines that can be stored at room temperature? What, what what's your thinking around that? So I think UNICEF's role in this case is really within the realm of the COVAX facility where UNICEF is procuring vaccines for 80 of the 92 um, AMC countries. So that whole process of assessing country readiness, analyzing national deployment and vaccination plans, that's all happening in collaboration with Gavi, uh, with WHO, um, with UNICEF immunization experts. And they'll be able to look at what the capacities and what the readiness of different countries around the world are. And from there, they'll be able to assess of the vaccines that are, are ready right now, um, that have received WHO pre-qualification or emergency use listings, which ones are ready to deploy and which countries are ready to receive them. And UNICEF is part of that partnership. Thank you. That's that's really helpful. And, and, and you know, uh, we, if you get a chance, I think there's lots of other Q and A questions around that as well that we can we can tackle individually for 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 people that's there. And maybe one that's kind of drawing on that is that we we've had a question just around sort of again coming back to trust and coming back to logistics and rollouts and the huge scale of actually getting these vaccine into to, to people. Um, you know, many countries are adopting approach of getting the military um, to to help and support this as well. Um, do you, do you think that affects public trust and perception and how can that be best handled? Anybody like to reflect on that?
Well, actually. Yes, Lily, please go ahead. Well, actually, in Indonesia, we actually uh, vaccinate uh, our presidents first, and then other important person first at national and subnational level. Uh, also, including the uh, the head of the military and the head of the police as well. And then, uh, in terms of uh, vaccine distribution, also uh, we involve them, uh, the army and the uh, police, uh, to to really assist. Uh, the district health office, the province health office, and doing uh, distributing the vaccines into uh, until the health center. I think that's uh, and then the the vaccinations uh, for first first vaccination for president and the most important persons at national and subnational level. That's uh, really can uh, build uh, public trust, uh, especially in Indonesia setting. I mean, thank you. And maybe that's, maybe, that's... maybe other country can other countries can can adapt or something consider consider to do to do the same maybe and I'll maybe turn to Gideon in a second just to reflect on you know his perception of the Philippines I don't know whether Lulu you want to build on that I think it'd be really nice to hear from your perception what are the key institutions key organizations with Indonesia for example that you think are, are taking a lead you've talked about you know um, senior politicians being involved in you know early stage vaccination what are, what are the key bodies that build trust is that you know in, in education in schools is that universities is that academic centers who, who do you think are the key organizations that need to be involved in vaccine rollout to to build that trust up well actually well, learning from uh, Mrs. Rubella Oh, sorry, Dr. Gideon, no, you want to... I think let, oh, let, no. let's um, maybe look okay. if you continue and we'll come to Gideon yeah. just in a second. Okay, uh, I think learning from MR uh, campaign, uh, the most influential organization is the Indonesia Ulama Council. That's why, that's why uh, from the beginning, very beginning, we, we, we have uh, processed uh, the whole fatwa for the COVID-19 vaccine, Sinovac that we are using now at the first beginning at the first phase, uh, phase of the COVID-19 vaccination, we are using Sinovac, and then uh, from the beginning, we 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 have processed uh, documents and then involved the uh, Ulema Council to 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 to, uh, to see to see how the vaccine is produced. Even they 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 went to the China to the to the producer to the manufacturer, and then see how it is uh, it process uh, how it produced, uh, and then. They can release now uh, the halal fatwa, and this is a very important weapon in Indonesia, uh, especially in terms of immunization program. Uh, uh, supports from the Ulama Council, the halal fatwa uh, for the vaccine is really, really, really the important ones. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Lily. Gideon. Yes. So. I like the Indonesian example as a comparison with the Philippines because, as Lulu said, they're mobilizing the military. And as one of the our attendees mentioned here, that they also mobilized uh, the military in the Philippines in the past for immunization campaigns. I think Pedrito de la Cruz. But at the same time, we also have some questions here about what about the military? Uh, is it Will it affect people's attitude? So I think it largely depends on the local context of how the military is viewed in a particular area, not just at country level, but at local level, because there are some, I'm sure there are some areas in the Philippines where the mere presence of the military can make people feel suspicious about, about the rollout. Whereas in some contexts, people might feel confident that it's the military or the police who are, who are helping administer. So this is largely local in terms of which groups will matter. In the Philippines, I would say that religious groups also, including Muslim leaders in Mindanao as well, because we have a majority Catholic population, but at the same time, we're a very diverse country. So it's not just one message. There, are, there should be many messages and many engagement points, including CSOs and uh, people's organizations who have more trust with a particular community. So I think that there has to be specificity in different populations. And number two, there has to be cons consistency. If your plan is to prioritize young people, as in, I think in Indonesia, they're trying that out, then there must be consistency in that because otherwise it will undermine the whole concept of the whole immunization. But if your other 
if your criteria is based on age or risk, then you should also follow that. So it's not so much what the plan is, but whether you're actually following the plan and you're being forthcoming about what the plan actually is. Thank you, Gideon. I want to come back to that point around sort of vaccine prioritization in a second. But let me come to Patrick first of all. Patrick, just wonder if you know, ADB, UNICEF have, are, are playing a key role in this uh, of rollout of vaccines across the region. What's your perspective on you know, the importance of organizations and the, the, the key players in sort of building this trust in, in vaccine rollout? I think at the, at the national level, um, there are some organizations that uh, the, uh, always uh, respond to whenever there's a crisis. For example, uh, in, uh, in Indonesia uh, and Philippines, these are two countries that uh, always have natural disasters and uh, they have uh, civil society organizations. Some of them have 1 million members, some of them have uh, 40,000 members. They already communicate uh, uh, whenever there's a crisis to try and uh, address, for example, if there's a typhoon, they move people from their villages to, to high grounds and so on. So they're very much trusted. And I think that involving uh, groups that are already uh, playing a very significant role in terms of uh, engaging the community uh, is quite central. And not just giving the vaccination, but uh, educating the people, following up on people. If, uh, for example, the health department finds out that uh, there's some people that are not coming back for the second dose, following up to find out why are they not coming back for the second dose. So this there's a massive infrastructure that's already out there in the communities uh, that, sh that we should tap on. And, uh, and the Gideon talked about, of course, the religious groups as well. So I think that uh, uh, this this is the this this is going to be a challenge for all of us to think outside the box and uh, not think just as health people, but uh, people that we need all other sectors uh, to be able to be able to uh, to be able to do to, to do do this. Uh, but I just wanted to say something about the military. Uh, the the U.S. military and the Australian military have actually been training a lot of military uh, organization across the region. And uh, in each of those, they're defining, uh, the military has to define what is its role. In some countries, in the, um, they have excellent logistics, they have air aircrafts, they have vehicles and so on, and they can move the vaccines very rapidly. So their role can just be maybe transportation, for instance. Uh, in, in other countries, uh, the military also has a very strong military medical team, and therefore the medical team can also provide direct vaccination. So I think uh, uh, the context is different. Um, People trust the military differently from one country to another, given the, their history. Uh, but I think defining what is the role, given the history, is extremely important. Over. Thank you, Patrick. So I'm going to. I, I realize again that you know the COVID vaccine. We, we've never been in this scale of a pandemic before. We're we're learning new things as we go forward. We we're lacking evidence for you know how we do things as well. One of the questions that you know we've been asked a couple of times in the chat box, but also countries are struggling with, is the prioritization of who receives a vaccine, whether that's healthcare workers first, whether that's elderly populations, populations at risk. I don't know whether you know among our group today whether any of you'd like to reflect on that uh, around your thoughts around, you know, I, I know countries are taking different approaches. Indonesia, as we, we've mentioned, Lulu, or, or, or you know, adopting an approach there. Anybody want to make any reflections on that or any uh, experiences? And if not, you know, the other sort of question leading on from that is the experience from, you know, past pandemics, you know, we, we, we talked in, in your area uh, of expertise, Lulu, around sort of, um, you know, other, uh, you know, infectious diseases like measles. Um, you know, we, we've we seen in, in other countries that people have been holding off getting vaccinations for other diseases. We've seen outbreaks of, you know, measles in other countries because people are, you know, not taking out vaccines that they would have done otherwise. What, what impact do you think that, uh, you know, the COVID vaccine will have another other infectious diseases more broadly? Well, I'm really hoping that it will, it will lead to a broader support for, for vaccines. But at the same time, it's a make or break moment because if something wrong happens in terms of communication and in terms of rollout, then it can affect other vaccine preventable diseases. On the other hand, if we see this uh, vaccination program as really being decisive in ending the pandemic, then it will definitely uh, win over people to the whole idea of vaccination. So I, I think that that should 
redouble our efforts to really invest a lot of time and thought and resources in making this right because we will be affecting not just the pandemic response but public health in itself. This is the whole campaign for public health. So understanding the sources of mistrust, being very proactive about it, and also listening, not just because it's so hard to do research nowadays because of the quarantine and all the pandemic restrictions, but doing online uh, research in itself can yield a lot of insights about what people are thinking. So there's no excuse for us not to start and continue understanding what people are thinking about the vaccines. Thank you, Gideon. Let me come to Lulu first, then I'll come to Wendy, and it'd be great to hear some of your reflections from your work in Africa, Wendy, as well. So let me come to Lulu first, and then we'll come to Wendy. Yes, thank you, Ashley. Uh, well, um, yes, uh, maybe I can answer by uh, learning from MR as well, because uh, when when we uh, face uh, when we face MR uh, campaign, and we have problem with um, halal haram issue, that really have impact on other uh, vaccines, uh, routine immunization vaccines, um, even until now. Uh, even the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, people uh, always uh, ask about, uh, is it halal? Is it, uh, uh, besides safe, uh, people also uh, always ask, uh, is it halal? Because they always, uh, back to MR campaign in uh, 2017 and 2018, uh, they, they, they really uh, have a concern in their mind about halal haram uh, issue. And then... Uh, when we are facing now COVID-19 vaccinations, they really um, asking about it again. Uh, and then also if we have like, um, uh, we don't expect we have like a serious AFI or something like that uh, during our COVID-19 uh, vaccination implementation, this will also uh, have a great impact on other uh, vaccines, uh, including uh, routine immunization vaccines. Thank you, Lulu. Wendy. Thanks, and I think you raise a really important point because I think COVID-19 could reverse decades of progress toward preventable child deaths. Global modeling is estimating between 250,000 and 1 million additional child deaths that we can anticipate. And some of these are vaccine preventable deaths. So I think going back to the topic of uh, vaccine logistics and and supply chains, preserving routine vaccine supply chains is an important priority. And it's definitely on our radar. I mean, globally, UNICEF has assessed um, sort of international transport and logistics capacities and, and found that even with routine vaccines and the massive push to get COVID-19 vaccines out, um, capacities look pretty good. The issue will be within countries and whether or not countries can stagger campaigns, integrate supply chains, and increase frequency of distribution as some of the options that they can consider, um, and carefully plan for the distribution of vaccines, both routine and COVID-19 vaccines, so that one doesn't impact on the other. And I think this is for any country. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And, you know, I, I think these are such important topics that we could probably talk about these all day. And I think it'd be really interesting to look back in a couple of years time around, you know, you know, how we address these challenges. And I'm sure we'll have lots of learning for future pandemics as well. We're, we're coming up to the end of today's session. And what I want to do is just, I think, give each of you a chance to sort of reflect on your key points or key learnings for the audience um, just before the end. So I'll come to you, you each in turn, um, just very briefly to kind of reflect on your key messages before we end today. Um, so maybe maybe starting with Gideon, if you're happy to go first, just to give us a couple of you know, key points or reflections that it's important for people to take away. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. So in all our countries and in the whole world, we should really bear in mind that vaccination programs are not just a public health campaign. These are political projects and these are cultural practices as well. So it's very important for us to be interdisciplinary in our approach, involving social scientists, communication experts, and of course, getting community input in how best to roll out 
vaccination. This has to be targeted in terms of messaging in languages, and people have to be consistent in their plans and in their communication. Thank you. Thank you, Gideon. Um, Lulu, would you like to go next? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ashley. So uh, maybe I just uh, want to highlight uh, the real-time monitoring uh, for mass immunization campaign, including this COVID-19 vaccination that will be covering a large number of a country population that uh, this can improve uh, data accuracy and coverage uh, as well of mass immunization campaign. Because this uh, real-time uh, monitoring can really enable uh, follow-up actions that are needed to be to be to be carried out uh, immediately uh, and then and then I think this is a uh, important aspect to be considered uh, for COVID-19 vaccination uh, rollout that's all Ashley thank you thank you Lulu um, Wendy thanks well I think I can sum it up really uh, in two words um Drawing back on my presentation, I think really the two words that come to mind are partnership and perseverance. As you can see, to make this global vaccine delivery happen, it needs a lot of pieces and a lot of partnerships and a lot of collaboration to get in place. And I think if we can go on some history from the Pacific is perseverance. We've managed, no matter what the difficulties have been, we've managed to find a way around whatever bottleneck or whatever blockage we've come across. And I think if we just keep at it and we, Put our heads together we'll find the way through thank you nice nice thoughts wendy and patrick let me turn to you for your final reflections um, we are trying to vaccinate billions of people uh, the numbers sound big uh, the bottom line is that people live in households and they live in communities and that should be the fulcrum of our support uh, because uh, if we do not educate uh, the, the, the households, communities, uh, then and they have the wrong information, uh, we'll have the best vaccines in the world, but people will not take the vaccine. So I think that focusing on the community uh, is extremely important. And just to reinforce the point that uh, Wendy talked about, um, we are trying to address this pandemic. Uh, and what I see in many countries is that the focus is just on COVID. And many, many, many countries they are forgetting about other vaccines and other uh, other conditions. And the challenge is that we could deal with COVID and then have another outbreak. And so it's important that that integrated approach of addressing COVID vaccine and other vaccines uh, uh, become the center of what we are talking about. The resources that we are putting to play to support COVID should also uh, su support other vaccination programs. And just to close that uh, this requires working across sectors and then the leadership uh, the uncoordination and partnership and financing are all elements that are required to be able to be successful. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. Um, I'm afraid that's the end of today's webinar. Thank you so much to all our panelists for the excellent presentations and great discussion. We've highlighted lots of challenges, but I remain very positive that we can overcome those um, in this huge uh, challenge of, of rolling out the vaccine across Asia. On behalf of BMJ, I'd like to thank the Asia Development Bank uh, for their partnership, for UNICEF, for their support. From BMJ, I'd like to thank the team, especially Lalitha, Tia and Kyle. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for participating. We, we've had a huge amount of discussion, uh, conversations and questions as well. We hope you find it valuable. Please don't forget to register for the COVID-19 Information Centre to get the latest evidence-based guidance on e-learning and COVID-19 and comorbidities, as well as news of our next webinars as well. And also, please let us know in the poll what you'd like to see next, and please provide your details uh, so we can keep you updated with what's happening and stay in touch. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. <laughs>